Well, two things I want to give you up front. This talk that I'm going to give today is kind of broken up into two little sections. I've got two points that are going to be in the first section. Because we could talk for like months and months and months on the topic of sanctification. I could come in here every Sunday and we could just take a facet of it and we could just break it down and spend a lot of time on it. And we could go from point to point to point and talk about, okay, this is, this is a facet of your sanctification. Uh, here is something topically that God wants to do in you and it's all part of your sanctification. Here is something that the world has to offer you that maybe we're, we're getting latched onto and we would say, for the sake of, of God's glory and for sanctification, God wants us to walk away with that. And we could talk about it and we could go in deeply to the theology of sanctification, but I just wanna mention two things primarily this morning. Practical things that I feel like if you will walk out of here gripped with, it might lead to your continued sanctification. The song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. You guys know that one? Look full in his wonderful face. That line, look full in his wonderful face. And then what does it say? Come on, Baptist, help me out here. What's the next line? And the things of earth will, will grow strangely dim. Strangely dim. If you turn your eyes upon Jesus and you look full, you look full in his wonderful face, the, what happens is the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of what? His glory and grace. That is what today's message is about. The sanctification that God wants to do in our hearts. And he does it by his power, by his presence, by his glory, and by his grace. Now, if you and I, if you and I will commit our lives to taking some steps to position and posture ourselves in a way that we are the recipients of the power that comes off the face of God and the glory that comes from the grace of God, if we get close to it, if we bring ourselves to it, God the Holy Spirit will sanctify you. He will sanctify you. It is a, it is a given. It is a given. Now, first, let's, let's define sanctification a couple different ways so that we all know. A working definition of sanctification one definition, and this just comes from Wikipedia, it says it's the act or process of acquiring sanctity, of being made or becoming holy, okay? So to sanctify is, is to literally set apart for particular use and a special purpose or work. Sanctify. Webster Dictionary says this. It says it's the state of growing in divine grace as a result of Christian commitment after baptism or conversion. The state of growing in divine grace. Okay, a little bit more of a, of a, of a Christian theology uh, a spin on this. Uh, from BibleStudyTools.com, a generic meaning of sanctification. I like this one. The state of proper functioning. The state of proper functioning. To sanctify something is to set something apart for intended use or purpose of its designer. So like if a, if a pen is being used to write, it's being sanctified. If a pen is sitting on the desk, it's not fulfilling the purpose for which the pen was created. When God's people live wholly set apart lives, they're being sanctified. They're walking in sanctification and they're bringing glory and honor to God because that's why we were made. So there's a process, there's a work that has to happen. Now, human beings do not ultimately sanctify themselves. So don't hear today that I'm saying, go from here and sanctify yourself. There's dual roles here. There are things that we do. Like I said, we bring ourselves into the presence and glory of God. We succumb ourselves to his presence and we get in the word of God. And, and there's a lot of disciplines that can help aid our sanctification, but ultimately the work of sanctification is a trinity work. It's a work of the triune Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So I'm not gonna go to these verses, but if you've got a pen and you wanna write some of these things down, you can go later, 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians 1.30 talks about the Father's work in sanctification through the Spirit of God and through the Son of God. 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the Spirit's work 13, 
2 Thessalonians 2.13, and 1 Corinthians 6.11 talks about the son's specific work. 1 Corinthians 6.11, but I'll, I'll, give you one, I'll give you one verse here. I'll give you two quick ones. This is 2 Corinthians 7. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Now, Paul says this, be holy. He, he records Jesus' words. He repeats it. He says, be holy as I am holy. Now, Jesus said that. Now, some of us have, not, have never even tried because the balance scales in our minds about holiness and sanctification have kind of tipped where I'm thankful for all the talks that we do about grace and the gospel, and we, we will never get away from that. It will always be Jesus. The reason of our, of our holiness will always be God, and the reason that we're surrounded in grace and going to heaven will always be God, but there's a work to play. Why would Jesus say, be holy as I am holy? There's a striving that we are to take part of. Paul here says, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body. When God works in us, there's this work, this ongoing work of confession, repentance, authenticity, pouring ourselves out on God. And so I want you to see that Christian faith and sanctification for us, it's not all passive. There's disciplines involved and there's a leaning into, into God that's involved. But I also want to conclude with this verse from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I will hit this one. Verse 13, it says this, but we ought always give thanks to God for you. So there's the Father, there's God the Father. Brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit. There's the second work, work of, of, of the Trinity and belief in the truth. And that's God's Son, the truth of the gospel. So you see Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're all a part of this sanctifying work of truth there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. So this is what sanctification is in the highest level possible. It's when God the Father, through the working and power of the Spirit, because of what the Son has done, takes human beings who are fallen and wretched and have been removed from their original purpose in the garden when we fell and every one of us step into that sin, just like Adam, and we are in need of grace, and we are not fulfilling our intended purpose. We are not sanctified. We are not holy before God begins to work on us. But then the Trinity gets involved. The gospel begins to churn in our hearts. We hear this truth and then something happens. We step into faith by repentance and God saved us, saves us. And sanctification in one sense happens and we are God's children. And then in a progressive sense, it begins. And we have this wonderful life of just growing into divine grace like the one definition said. So that's what sanctification is. It's the, it's the process that you and I become more holy. Why? Because we, like a Pharisee, decided we would just be better every day? Nope. But we did decide to fall prostrate and give everything we've got to the gospel and to the work of Jesus in our lives, and then he begins to sanctify us for his glory and for his honor. So here's Here's two primary ways I would, would give you today that sanctification happens. Very important ways, two primary ways. And this is going to be kind of the middle body of, of my message today. And then I'm going to close with a little popcorn stuff, like a little rabbit trail of, 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 of things that I just feel like uh, I, I wanted to give you today um, as I think of the way I would like to see God's people continue to be sanctified so that we stand out for God's glory and honor. Number one way that the Trinity will sanctify you, the number one way, I believe, is the presence of God, the face of God. Remember, the face of God, if we look in his wonderful face, the things of the earth grow strangely dim. So I think, number one, the presence of God. Turn to Exodus 29. Turn to Exodus 29. God is giving his people Israel, who by the way, he has sanctified and called out and set apart so that they would look different than any other nation. And so he sanctified them first by all the miracles and by saving them and by the commandments and by saying, I'm gonna be your God. So they already stand out. 
but then he gives them kind of a set of, of laws to obey so that they would their, their work of sanctification would be ongoing, complete with a temple and rituals and priests and sacrifice, ne- never complete, never able to fully remove sin from God's people, but in a sense, keep them set apart and keep them working towards being set apart so that the whole world knows that there's a God and he's going to do it through Israel. And so this is what's going on. He's consecrating them and he gives them a law. And I'm going to skip a few verses because I, I just kind of set it up. Look at verse 43 in Exodus 29. He says, there, talking about the tent of meeting, talking about when they come together, there I will meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified by my glory. So their meeting place, their church, their tent will be sanctified by the presence of God. 44, I will consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me. 45, I will dwell among the people of Israel and be their God. 46, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. That's the presence of God. I am the Lord their God. What you're seeing is God is saying, I will sanctify my people, but the way I'm going to do it is I'm giving them a means by which they can consistently come into my presence because that is what truly sanctifies people. I mean, look at the face of Moses. He came the closest to God and his face literally physically illuminated to the point he had to veil his face when he stood around other people. So God is saying, I will dwell with my people and my dwelling with them will be the primary cause of their sanctification. That will mostly be what sets them apart. Not all the laws, that's part of it. Those are second and third, third, third level things, but primarily I will sanctify my people with my very presence by dwelling with them. Uh, Leviticus 20, it's the next book over. Leviticus 20, verses six through eight. If a person turns to mediums and necromancers, whoring after them, I will set my face against them. Now, uh uh-oh, because God just said, I'm going to set my face towards them and dwell with them. Now there's this warning in Leviticus 20 that says that if we go and we start breaking God's laws and we start doing wickedness and we start carrying out things that God didn't intend for us to do, he's telling his people, I will set my face against them and cut them off from among his people. So it's when God's face is set towards us that we're sanctified. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. It says in verse 8, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That's Leviticus 20, 6 through 8. So again, the presence of God, the face of God. Now, let me give you just a couple of, of other biblical examples about the presence of God. Do you remember Isaiah in chapter 6? And I probably have told you this before, but I think it's just one of the greatest illustrations about how the presence of God is meant to sanctify you. Isaiah is the the chosen prophet of God to the nation of Israel, arguably one of the more, more holy guys in all the nation of Israel as he speaks God's truth to the nation. But in Isaiah chapter six, he's caught up to the third heaven. He gets a vision. He gets to actually go into heaven and see what it looks like. And then says this, I saw the glory of God, the train of God's robe, and it filled the entire temple. I don't know how big the temple in heaven is, but the entire thing was filled with the robe of God that came from the throne. And then there's the other sights and sounds that we know about, like the 24 elders, and then all the other beasts that are flying around. And then as far as the eye can see, you know, legions of people that are singing, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah gets to see this. So he gets to see the presence of God and the face of God. And the very next thing that comes out of his mouth is, woe is me. Now, do you think Isaiah was sanctified in that moment? Yeah. I mean, he saw the power and presence of God, but in sanctification, he steps back and says, woe is me. I'm unclean. I'm from a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. But it's in that confession after seeing the presence of God that he realigns and repositions himself to what he really is and who he needs to the, the way he needs to be thinking, which is, wow, man, after seeing the glory of God, I sure am unclean. I sure am unclean. But in a way that works for his sanctification. Paul, remember Paul in Romans says, wretched man that I am. 
present tense. Now this is after writing like the first six books of, of six books of Romans, planting churches, traveling around all over the place. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I mean, he is so confident in the way he walks in sanctification that he actually beckons people publicly to follow him and says, imitate me. At the same time in the present tense, he stands and says, wretched man that I am. You can only say that if you're in the presence of God. If you're not in the presence of God, you get a little cocky and you're like, you know, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Like the Pharisees, you know, my cup is clean. I think I'm all right. And you mistake outward holiness and you mistake the things that your mind tells you to do for heart holiness. Heart holiness only comes through the presence of God. And when Paul says, when Paul says, wretched man that I am, He's not saying I'm the biggest, most dirtiest, rotten sinner that you've ever seen, and I'm committing all these moral failures. He's not saying that. He's just saying when I walk in the presence of God and when I'm close to the Lord, it's the, the, the difference in his holiness versus where I'm at as a man is so different that all I can say is, wow, I'm such a wretch. But it's in saying that I'm a wretch and casting all of your confidence in the grace of Jesus that then that grace comes and that empowerment comes to step back in to sanctification by faith. And then you find a little bit more victory over sin, a little bit more confidence in your identity, a little bit more boldness and power to live out the gospel. And it all comes by positioning yourself in the presence of Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What is your snare what is that snare, that sin, that thing in your life that you just, man, it just, it tempts you and often actually pulls you down, pulls you away from what God wants you to be? What is that thing? Think about it. Now think about this. With that thing, that snare, that thing that's in your mind that you, you realize this is my strongest temptation. Now, now imagine yourself in the presence of Jesus. Now, I know that's hard to imagine, but think of like Revelation 4 and 5. I mean, imagine yourself at the throne, like Isaiah or like John the Revelator, right? Imagine you're seeing it and he's being worshiped and he's holy and it's sights and sounds that your mind has never seen and no one can describe. Or imagine Jesus on the cross as the wrath of God pours out upon him and he says it is finished. Or imagine the power and the earthquake and the guards just fainting as, as the tomb is opened and, and, and God says it's enough and it's done and son come out. Imagine those moments and now compare that with your snare. Right? I mean, imagine the power of the gospel and the glory of God and the scenes that are happening now in heaven and then take your little dumb snare, the thing that constantly pulls you down and compare the two. There's no comparison. See, getting into the presence of God causes the snares of your heart and the things of the world to go strangely dim. It causes them to become weak and powerless. Don't walk away from here and think about that snare and say, I'm not gonna give in to you anymore. No, you just committed the first mistake. Go get in the presence of God. That's what I'm telling you to go do. Go get in the presence of God and watch the snare be loosened from you. The presence of God. You know, I think this is ultimately why we don't have movements like the Great Awakening in the U.S. You guys want to see revival? I mean, gosh, does our land need revival? Does our culture need revival? Man, we need it, and I want to see it. And I think that a reason that it's not happening, a reason that it's not happening is, is this. When you've got leaders and church leaders that have a greater fear that people are going to leave their church and aren't going to be sitting in the same seat the next week, a greater fear than the fear that maybe there are people sitting in those same pews that don't experience the presence of God, that's a big problem. Our priorities are upside down. I just don't hear a lot of talking anymore in the guys that I listen to about the holiness and the power and the presence of God. And that's all we got to bring change. We're worried about so much other stuff. This is the primary thing to be focused on, the presence of God. The other one, the presence of God, I think is the best, the primary way that we're sanctified, just getting in his presence. 
but the other one is like it. And these aren't one and two, it's just both together and they're both equally important. The other one is the word of God. I mean, we've been given a timeless book. Like I told you earlier, aliens, we're different. We're not from the world. We need to be reading the book that's also not from the world. Everything else that you read and input into your mind that's not that book is from this world and it will lead you astray. And no wonder we spend 95% of our time, news, sports, social media, talking to our friends about nothing. And if we're lucky, maybe a tiny percentage of our day in the transcendent book, the one that's from out of this world, the thing that can teach us aliens how to live in the earth, that's out of balance. The word of God, like go to John 17. John 17, you guys know this one. I mean, Jesus is like just moments before his betrayal and he's about to go to the cross and he's spending some intimate moments with his disciples and he prays over them. This incredible prayer, but he prays to God. God is his audience, but he gives the disciples the benefit of hearing it. And then he even prays for us, future believers later. But look what he says in verse 14, uh, speaking of us being aliens, he says, I've given them your word. So this whole section that we're about to read, it's banked on the word of God, the truth of God that Jesus directly gave to his disciples. He says, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Listen to this. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Don't take my aliens out of the world, my people. Don't take them out yet. But I ask that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just like I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. The world and the evil one, church, listen to me. It has no power over you. The evil one and this world don't feel defeated. It has no power over you. Jesus prayed to the Father right here in John 17 that they will be sanctified through the word of God and through the truth of God, and that makes us overcomers, those of us who believe. And then he says, as you sent me into the world, so I'm sending them into the world. I love that. He's not out just to protect us. He, says, he doesn't say, go home into your corner and just wait, I'll come back again. He says, no, the evil one is around, he's lurking, but I'm gonna sanctify you with my truth and then send you back into the word, world. And only the word of God has the power to do that in us. It's for their sake that I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. So Jesus's method is to sanctify them and send them. You know, Jesus is into catch and release. He fishes for men, he catches them, he cleans them up and releases them back into the world. I like what Paul says in Acts 20. He's standing there with the Ephesian elders. And this is incredibly, this is incredibly meaning, meaningful for me because you guys know if you saw the email and you heard my announcement last week that I've got about three months left with you that I'm going to be transitioning out. I'm going to be moving on in January. If you haven't seen the email, um, catch up with me afterwards. I know you're like, whoa, that just came out of nowhere. But this Paul, this is this is intimate moment because he has worked with the church in Ephesus and he spent time, I mean, sweat with them and bled with them and built the church with them. And he's got these guys that he's standing with on the beach and he's kind of giving them a word as he leaves. And one of the things that he says is, I commend you to God in verse 32 of Acts 20. He says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That's the word of God, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are being sanctified. Paul's kingdom mentality is that the church is the Lord's. The word of God will sanctify everyone who puts their face into it. And Paul says, I'm moving on and I'm leaving you with this word. I'm leaving you with the word of God and I commend it to you and I commend you to it and it will sanctify you and give you an inheritance. You'll get to belong with the people of God and be used with the people of God. So let's talk just a second about the word of God. You guys know as a method We've talked about soaping, right? You need a plan to read the Bible. I don't care if it's soaping or something different, but you need a discipline, a plan. You just need to settle it. Just settle it right now. Like you eat every day, right? At some point you've settled that. You're like, I'm going to eat every day. You sleep every day. Most of you hopefully brush your teeth every day. At some point you settled that. Like you decided I'm going to brush my teeth every day. 
So I'm asking you to settle this about reading the Bible. Just settle it. I've got to eat. I've got to feed myself on the word of God. And so commit to something. But soaping is a powerful way. S-O-A-P, scripture, observation, application, prayer. 10, 15 minutes, you get in the word of God, the spirit will give you a word and God will meet with you and the word of God will do what we are talking about. It will sanctify you into the image of his son. Did you know to this day, I still remember the very first time I ever soaked. I remember it almost verbatim, but I remember the principle. I was in Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is mostly about church discipline, but then right after the church discipline passage, Jesus tells this story about how little kids have angels. He goes, be careful how you treat these little kids because I tell you that their angels in heaven never see, never cease to see the face of my father. I read that one day, soaping in the scripture and the word of God sanctified my heart and I'm still reaping the benefits of that soap two years ago. Because when I see a little child and I'm treating that little child with contempt or haste or I'm looking at my phone while they're saying, daddy, 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 daddy. The word of God brings that soap back and says, their angels in heaven never see, cease to see the face of my father. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This, this little kid right here, this is the kingdom of God. There's nothing more important than that. The word of God did that in me. I'm not boasting in that. I'm just telling you that this is the way it works. He gives you a word, a simple little Bible study, and then it just affects you the rest of your life. That's sanctification. That's God's power. That's what he wants to do through his word. So we have to figure out how to eliminate the noise and to get in the word of God. And, and we need both of these. We need the presence of God in our lives. We need the power of God in our lives. Now I'm gonna wrap up the, la the last 10 minutes and I'm gonna just give you some stuff that's just on my heart. Some things, practical sanctification things that I feel like, wait a minute, Christians, we're not like the world. Like we don't do this. We don't believe those things. We do this. We believe these things. And as I say this stuff, if some of this convicts you, if you're like, amen or yeah or whatever, or I need to work on that, great. But I'm not asking you to make a bunch of decisions. I'm asking you to, to do the first two things. Get into the presence of God and get into the word of God. And maybe he'll bring some of this stuff to light. But we need some rewiring. Like aliens, like we, because we're not from here, when we step into discipleship and we start walking in sanctification, the word of God ten, uh, attempts to begin to rewire our thinking so that we are sanctified and so that we behave like God has called us to behave. But Romans 12 says something very interesting. Romans 12, one and two says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. So there's patterns in the world. The world has patterns. The world has systems and things and just assumptions that everybody's gonna do or believe or say. And we all just got kind of get caught up in that big net. It's patterns. But the alien, the Christian, the person with the spirit of God sometimes has to step out of that and go, am I doing that just because everybody's doing that? Or, or is, the, is the word of God telling me I should believe something different? And so I want to give you a couple of things to think about. And these are, these are just basic, I believe, worldly patterns that some of us and the church by and large has bought into. Okay, youth, I'm going to talk to you. One, one of these things is that adolescence is is uh, this time that kids are kind of finding their identity. And so you've got this period of, you know, eight or 10 years where you just kind of get to waffle around and, and flop around and, and, and make weird decisions. And, um, and then at some point later, maybe, and for a lot of people, maybe even later in your 20s, you'll kind of grow up and get it and life will kind of, listen, I, I believe adolescence is a myth. Now I'm not saying there's not things that teenagers, I have teenagers, I'm not saying there's not, changes and hormones and things that they go through. But I'm a believer, and maybe this is old school, that you just go from childhood to older childhood to young adulthood to adulthood. And I believe 12, 13, 14 years old, you call those kids up and say, man, you can understand the word of God, man. You can do what God is calling you to do. I'm not giving you a get out of jail card, free card for the next eight years so you can just do what you want to do. Just cause you know, psychologists tell us that you're adolescent and we should, you know? I think that teenagers, and I know this from history, have been the cause of some of the world's greatest revivals because they got a hold of God, because they grew up, because they matured in their faith and they were bold and they stood up for God. So that's, that's, that's just one thing, just rewire the brain. If you're thinking, uh, kids, I can't trust them, they're not gonna do it. 
that you're wrong. And don't ever speak that over a teenager in your life. You tell them at 12 or 13 or 14 to pick up your mantle, pick up godliness. And what does God want to use you right now to do? Another one, a rewiring, if we're going to be good aliens, fatherhood, men, listen to me, men. The world believes that men, their primary role is to go to work, to make money and come home, sit on the couch and watch football, and mostly just kind of keep their mouth shut, keep the peace. Dude, that's not what a godly biblical man is. But the world believes that, and we kind of sometimes believe that too, a lot of us men, because it's kind of easy. But the primary role of a guy, in my mind, first of all, is to be in the presence of God, but secondly, to lead his family well and to lead in our culture well and to be bold and to be connected, not disconnected. A man of God connects with his wife. He connects with his kids. He knows their heart. He takes time to sit with them and ask them questions. How is your day? How can I pray for you? What do you struggle with? How can I be your friend? That's what a man is in my mind, not a guy that sits on a couch and watches football. Now, I like football with everybody else, but if that's all a guy does, and if that's his identity, something's wrong. There's a, there's a documentary that Kirk Cameron put out called Connect. And if you haven't seen it, I want you all to go see it. If you've got teenagers, it is a must watch. It's on Netflix, I think. If not Amazon, you can buy it. But it's called Connect, and it's all about protecting our kids in a digital age, connecting with your kid's heart. But it really brings out this idea that there needs to be a warrior in every father or your kids are not gonna make it. And it's not enough to go to, go to work and bring home the bacon. That's a good thing. We gotta do that, but we gotta do more than that. Don't let your mind be rewired the wrong direction. Another one, man, this is a big one for us, materialism. Now, I'm not gonna go into a whole rabbit trail on this. I mean, First John chapter two, you guys know this. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. There's nothing wrong with money. God uses money for his glory. There's nothing wrong with relationships. There's really nothing wrong intrinsically with social media if we're mature enough to use it for God's glory as a platform, right? Many aren't. But materialism in the world and things and stuff, and there, here's the issue with it, and this is all I'm gonna say about it. What happens is it becomes supplemental and it removes from us the key ingredient that we need to pray, which is desperation. Because what happens is the world has all of these supplements and you're like, man, I'm not feeling good or life is hard or whatever. So I'm gonna hop over on social media and just waste 15 minutes of my life. Or you know what? I'm just, I'm just gonna go to back to that bottle or I'm just gonna go to my favorite TV show or I'm just gonna sit on the couch and unplug because man, it's just hard. And you, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're following the patterns of this world and you're supplementing your mind and your soul care that needs to happen here with what the presence of God and the word of God is supposed to be doing and what you're forfeiting ultimately your soul, but what you're forfeiting is desperation. You're dependent on something else. And so you're not coming to God in desperation. That's what materialism does. Don't do that. Like let yourself be rewired for, to seek the presence of God primarily. Identity is a big one. Teenagers, identity is a big one. I talked to you about this last week. We'll probably hit it again tonight, but you are more than what your friends tell you you are. Your phone tells you you are. This culture tells you you are. Identity is a thing that some people struggle with well into their 30s and 40s. Who am I? What does God want to use me to do? Why do we struggle with identity? It's because we listen to too many voices. Everybody in the world has identity issues. You know why? Because they don't know who their master is. They've never met the God who created them. Naturally, they would struggle with identity, but not God's people. So if you're a person of God, realize that I am connected first and foremost to the identity of my father, God. I am who he says I am, just like Pastor Matt is talking to us about this series, and I'm nothing else. And if you strip everything out of my life, you take away my family, you take away my money, kids, you take away my games or my social media, you take away any of that stuff, just take it away from me. You know what? Because if I've got Jesus, I've got everything that I need because that's where my identity is. But play that exercise in your mind. Take it away. What's the thing that you love? relationship, material thing, earthly thing, tangible thing, whatever, whatever, whatever is not going to heaven with you, whatever it is that you put so much of your time and effort to take it away. And who are you without it? Could you really stand there and say, I've got Jesus and that's all that I need. He's enough. A couple more quick ones and then I'll wrap up in prayer. This is one that's close to my heart. <clears throat> but there's a prevailing belief in our culture that children are not a blessing that children are inconvenient, that they're kind of obnoxious, that they're hard. And 
And it's fine if, if that's a pattern in the world that, and, and it is. I mean, look around in our culture. There are cultures right now whose governments are giving people money to have babies because their, their culture, their nation's not going to make it. They did the math and they figured out like, hey, well off in the future, like we don't exist anymore. We're not having enough kids to even keep our nation going. So they're paying people to do it. What happened? People stopped believing kids were a blessing. They started believing kids were a burden and they stopped having kids. Now, I'm not telling everybody to have seven kids like I've got. I'm not doing that. It's not about a number. The Bible doesn't give a number. It's a calling, right? I'm asking you to change your mind, though, about what kids are, that they are a blessing, that God gives them to us. Psalm 127 says kids are an inheritance. And so those of you that don't have small kids, there's always a way to walk out this principle in practicality. I mean, you can spend time with your grandkids. You can spend time with other kids, kids in the neighborhood. You can bless them. Kids, let me tell you something. Kids are alone. Kids are alone and they are bombarded by our enemy very strategically with a lot of things that are causing a lot of problems in young people, in young kids. And I f think the answer is the church being sanctified to rewire their brain to think, wait a minute, kids are important. They're the next generation. They're a blessing. And so I'm gonna strategically plan to, to bless the kids in my life because they are a blessing. I'll, I'll close with this one. Love, this is, a, this is a pattern in the world, okay? This is a pattern in the world. Love never offends anyone. You ever seen that pattern? You ever get caught up in that pattern? You know something's going on that's shady and you know it and you're like, well, I'm not going to say anything. I ain't going to do it. If I do it, they might think I don't love them. Wow, guys, this, this, is, this is a big one in our culture because what we're seeing is the two extremes. The pendulum is swinging. Yes, social media fuels a lot of this stuff. Our master Jesus is the perfect balance of love and truth. But what we do as humans is we tend to fall to one of those and completely devoid of the other one. So what we'll do is we'll be like all love, which is where our culture is these days. Everything goes, it's all about how you feel. And if you tell somebody something that's contrary to how they're feeling, you hurt their feelings, you did not love them. That's a pattern in the world, but it's not truth. That's the one side that love is about how you feel and love never offends. The other side, and this gets me real angry because I sometimes want to jump through my computer and physically punch people in the face because they say things like, but it's the truth. Yeah, but you just crushed the human being that's on the other side of that screen. Like, what are you doing? Where's the spirit of God? It's like all truth and no love. Like, where's the balance and the diplomacy? God's people in this day and age, we've lost all of that. And so what I'm doing is asking for God's sanctified people to rewire your brain and to navigate that tension between truth and love because Jesus was both. Jesus could look at a person like he did the woman at the well and say, you've got five husbands, you're living in adultery, you need to change what you're doing and then do it in a way that she would embrace him and was like, man, this guy really loves me. And then she went and flipped her whole community upside down for Jesus. How does he do that? She never questioned his love from the very beginning, never. Never. How does he do that? Because he authentically loves and he knows how to navigate relationships. That's the big one. Relationships are this perfect, beautiful balance of truth and love. And the wounds of a friend are very faithful when your friend comes to you and sees you erring. And you know, you never would question whether they loved you, man. This guy loves me. But then they come and deliver a hard word and you go, ooh, I have to sit with that. Now, I know they love me. And so they must be, they must be wanting my best interest people throw this verse out all the time. Like, you know, well, the Bible says, judge not. You know what? In context, this is what it says. Judge not, lest you be judged. With the same measure that you judge, it'll be measured back before you go to take the speck out of your brother's eye, remove the plank out of your own eye. So actually, it's actually the opposite. Matthew 7 is not a, hey, don't judge people because that's not your job. It's a, this is how it works. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't go do it with a big fat log in your eye. Get yourself right and then go help people. So again, I just threw these out as a practice, so to speak, 
of you to see just some generic things of how patterns in the world, we get caught up and we get wired up in that stuff where sanctification, the presence of God, the word of God is meant to rewire us for our original purpose, which is to live as aliens in this earth for the glory of God so that people will see, so that people will know about God and so that people will glorify God because of the way that God perfects himself in us. That is the work of sanctification. So that's what I'm calling you guys to be, aliens, different, and embrace it. Teenagers, tonight, don't know how many of you will be there, but we're going to go to step three of this, which is the glorious inheritance that we have in Christ after we've walked a while. What is the destiny of an alien? Like, where are we all headed with this? What does it look like after we've lived this out practically? And that's what I'm going to do with the teenagers tonight. So good stuff. Thanks for your attentiveness. Thanks for listening so well. I have a lot of amen faces. Hey, keep giving Pastor Matt the amen faces. It's so much more fun preaching when you're like, yeah. You know, give, you know lead us on, you know, because sometimes if you're like, you know, then it's hard, it's hard to preach, you know what I'm saying? So let's, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this group of incredible folks. Thank you so much for the word of God and the truth of your word, God. And Lord, we know that your will today is to sanctify us. God, Jesus prayed that you would sanctify our hearts in truth so that as we're sent, as we live missionally, temporarily in a place that we don't belong, you would do radical things like bring prodigals into the faith and like spread your grace all over the world and your fame and your kingdom and your glory would, would be spread so that souls are saved, God, and, and so that reconciliation is brought to a very broken place and you are calling us to do that in our part in sanctification is a key ingredient to all of this. So help us to own our identity today, God. Help us to embrace who we are and who you're making us and what you're doing in us, God. And if nothing else, use us for your glory and your honor, no matter what it costs us. We are your people, sanctified by your spirit, called according to your purpose. And we are here for you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray.